Yes, he will. He'll give you everything. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That is the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church Choir with music from our 2023 Fall Revival with Pastor C.T. Townsend. That's Magnify. And that's uh, Tommy Bartlett and Caitlin Swore singing lead on that. I think last night in our two-hour Bible study, I mentioned it was uh, Tommy Bartlett and a number of others. Well, it's just Caitlin Swore singing with them there, uh, with the choir backing them up. Tommy and Caitlin just have powerful voices with tremendous range, and it sounds like there's maybe a third person somewhere in there. But nope, just them. A great job. Magnify, taken right from Psalm 34, verse number 3. Well, good evening and welcome to Tuesday Night Prophecy. It's Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. I'm Dr. Joseph Speciali, and I'm pleased that you've chosen to make our Bible study part of your day whenever you're watching or listening to us. I know you could be doing a number of different things uh, right now, and you've chosen to study God's Word, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer and begin our study, we just want to bring a couple of important prayer requests to your remembrance. First of all, we need to all be re uh, reminded to pray for the Hurricane Helene victims. Uh, those impacted by this storm still uh, cover five states, from Florida on up to uh, North Carolina, uh, and every, every place in between there, pretty much. Florida, Georgia, South Carolina... East Tennessee and, and West North Carolina particularly. And uh, we know there's been a lot of churches in the region, including our own, that have sent uh, representatives down there to Western North Carolina, the Asheville area, to help out getting boots on the ground there. And I don't think it is um, an exaggeration to use the expression boots on the ground because from what I understand from those who've been there, it is a war zone. It looks like bombs were dropped in Asheville, North Carolina, and the surrounding area. Uh, people are still missing. Bodies are being recovered in trees and so on. It is a, a devastation. And so pray for the families. Uh, pray for the communities, the churches, uh, and the rebuilding effort. The Lord is in this. He is. He has control over all of this, and he's going to get glory somehow. And he allowed this for a reason. So pray that he gets the glory in each and every impacted individual's lives, okay? And then the other thing we want you to pray for is that this week, specifically in just, well, less than 48 hours from now, uh, we're going to begin our 2024 version of Judgment Island at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. And that'll be running this week and next week, Thursday through Saturday each week. Uh, Thursday and Friday, we're going to open up at 6 o'clock Eastern and Saturday at 4.30. Now, I'm going out on a limb here because we haven't put a, a set start time on Saturday the 26th, but I know that Saturday the 19th, we're starting at 4.30, and I think that uh, it's a fair bet as well that the following week, rather than opening at 5, we're also going to be opening at 4.30. So, uh, church groups go through this week. So if uh, churches have scheduled an appointment with us to bring a busload, a van load of folks, they're going to get to go through this upcoming week. And we've got, uh, from what I understand, a pretty large number of church groups. And then next week it's open to the public, first come, first serve. And if you're unfamiliar with what this ministry is, it's essentially a Christian, I don't want to say spin, but... Uh, because I don't want to put Christian labels on things that God does not endorse, and God does not endorse uh, the celebration of Halloween. Um, but uh, since haunted houses are designed to get the adrenaline going, right, to invoke the fear response and get adrenaline produced and all that, and that gets people all hyped up and jacked up and all that, well... About 30 years ago or so, um, our youth pastor at the time, uh, Brent Randolph, uh, the Lord gave him the idea of doing something at that time called Judgment House. And what it is in, in concept is, is that we take people on a tour through a series of uh, scenarios 
Uh, these scenarios are played out uh, in skits or acts, if you will, in various rooms through in, in, that are in the dormitories of our church camp. Okay, and there's about five or six separate rooms where what's demonstrated is the imminency of death, frankly. Um, and then after all of that, uh, there's two special rooms. One is called the Hell Room and one is the Heaven Room, where the people who in the previous five or six situations have died and the, the, if they were saved, they went to heaven and they appear in the Heaven Room. But if they died without Jesus, they're in the, they're in the Hell Room. And we portray what it is like in Hell in heaven, okay? And in the heaven room, after the person who died that was saved receives their reward, we have a gospel presentation and an invitation from our pastor or a member of our pastoral staff. And each person is, uh, is given the opportunity to receive Christ. And so in the past 30 some odd years, we've, we've had tens of thousands come through. And Hundreds, if not thousands, trust the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. So please be in prayer for this ministry. It is our largest community outreach during the year, and the Lord has blessed it every time we've had it, okay? And we want to see people saved. All right. That said, now let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll jump into our study in Daniel chapter 5. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the honor and privilege we have to study your word yet again. And we thank you for each one that's joined us, Lord, and we pray you bless them for their love of your word, for their interest to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. We pray that you meet each need represented in their lives here tonight, whether it be a financial need, a physical need, or a spiritual need. We know that we all have lost loved ones or neighbors and co-workers that need Jesus, and we pray that you'd help us to be a light and a voice to them. Pray that you send the right person across their path, if it's not us, Lord, to reach them before it's too late. We pray that you be with your word tonight, that it go forth in power and, a, and in the Holy Ghost and with much assurance, that everything you want said would be said tonight, Lord, and that you'd, you'd uh, feed your sheep here tonight, Lord. I surrender myself as a vessel to you, Lord, to fill me. And because uh, if you don't, then we, then we're truly doing this, doing all of this in vain. And I pray that Jesus Christ get the glory in everything that's said and done. And we ask it all in Jesus' name, Amen. All right, let's turn our Bibles to Daniel five. I think we left off at verse number eleven. So that's where we're going to pick up tonight. The queen uh, has entered into the banquet house here. Uh, as word has gone out to the wise men of Babylon to come in and read the writing, the handwriting on the wall, and give the interpretation, Belshazzar is given this splendid offer that anybody who's able to do this is going to uh, receive tremendous honors. They are going to receive a gold chain about their neck. They're going to be the third ruler in the kingdom. And yet they could not read it, much less interpret it. But the queen mother hears about uh, this offer, and then she comes into the banqueting house here in verse number 10. And we mentioned last week that we believe the queen here is, of course, not, the, the, not, not a wife of Belshazzar, but the queen mother. Two main uh, theories regarding her identity are that, number one, she's Belshazzar's mother, and that's what I personally believe and that her historical name is Nitocris, or Nitocris, however you want to pronounce that, N-I-T-O-C-R-I-S. I pronounce it Nitocris. And uh, she was one of the two daughters of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? And she was married to Nabonidus. So Nitocris is Belshazzar's mother, Nabonidus his father. Another theory, fairly popular, is that uh, this queen mother was actually the widow of Nebuchadnezzar, or Amatus, the Median, uh, that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar married, and, and his uh, tradition states that she's the reason why uh, he had the hanging gardens um, erected there in Babylon, because she missed the topography of her homeland there in Media. So he had the hanging gardens 
constructed there in Babylon, one of the ancient wonders of the world. Um, in which case, uh, then the queen mother would be Belshazzar's grandmother, wouldn't she? So either theory can fit. Uh, there's nothing in the text that I can see that would refute one or the other. Both of them fit. I just personally favor it being um, one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, namely Nidocris, Belshazzar's mother. So verse number 11, here's what the queen mother says to Belshazzar. She says, there's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in thy days, of the, and in the days rather, of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. So you note here that uh, uh, the queen mother goes to Belshazzar when she hears about this offer because she knows, even though Belshazzar apparently has no idea who Daniel is or no recollection, no memory of who he is, the queen mother certainly does. And she's going to offer up a solution for Belshazzar. The lost know who to go to in a crisis. The queen mother knew that Daniel, the man of God, would have the answer, that he would be able to come through. But we note here that even though she personally had confidence that Daniel could resolve this riddle, um, she still embraces polytheism. She says, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods? Well, if this is, and, and we believe that she certainly was either Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, Nidocris, or his widow, Amethyst, either one, they didn't pay attention to Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. That's detailed in at the end of Daniel 4. Because Nebuchadnezzar's final testimony was that the God of Daniel is the true and living God. He is the Most High. He is the God of Heaven. And there is no other. And yet here, Nidocris, I believe this is, says, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, plural. So she's a polytheist still. Okay. Um, so the queen mother basically gives the same testimony of Daniel that her, that her father, Nebuchadnezzar, gave of him 33 years earlier, before his conversion there in Daniel 4, when he had his second dream, okay? So specifically, Daniel 4, verses 8 and 9, and verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar mentions the spirit of the holy gods being in Daniel back then. Again, 33 years earlier. So that is the testimony of her father that Nidocris remembers. Not that the Holy Spirit is in Daniel, but the Spirit of the Holy Gods. Big difference. Big dif difference. But what this means, the fact that she's repeating uh, the testimony of her father from 33 years earlier, it means that the two had a relationship at that time and supports the view that, she's, that she is either Nidocris, a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, or Amethyst, who is who would be the widow of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? In the days of thy father, we've already mentioned that father here is used uh, uh, in the sense of, a, of an ancestor, okay? Um, because Nebuchadnezzar is specifically Belshazzar's grandfather, not his father. So father in the sense of an, of an ancestor. Light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. So, beginning here in verse 11, we're going to see Daniel as a type of the Holy Spirit. When we get to chapter 6, we're going to see Daniel as a type of Jesus Christ. But here in Daniel 5, he's a type of the Holy Spirit. And from verses 11 and 12 primarily, but also by virtue of 
how he's promoted or what he's promoted to in verse 29. So let's take a look at the nine particulars here in this chapter alone in which Daniel's a type of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, if we, were, if we had a formal Bible institute and you were taking a test, this would be a great test question. Give me four specific ways in which Daniel is a type of the Holy Spirit in Daniel 5. And you'd have to list four of these nine. Okay? But here they are. Light was in him. Here in verse 11. In verse 11 and 12, understanding was in him. These are all things that are qualities, characteristics of the Holy Spirit of God as well. Verse 11, wisdom is in him. Verse 12, an excellent spirit was in him. The Holy Spirit is indeed excellent with a capital E. Knowledge was in him. Verse 12, he was an interpreter. Verse 12, specifically of divine revelation. Well, the Holy Spirit of God is the author of the divine revelation, the scriptures. So obviously as the author, he is also the interpreter. Uh, number seven, he showed or revealed hard sentences, verse 12. He dissolved doubts, verse 12. And then in verse 29, he became the third ruler. We mentioned this last time, how the how uh, in this case Belshazzar could not promote the interpreter of the handwriting of the wall to the second ruler of the kingdom because that's the position he occupied, his father Nabonidus occupying the place of first ruler. So he could promote the person to the place of third ruler. Well, when it comes to the triune Godhead, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it's always in that order. The first person, the Father, the second person, the Son, also referred to as the Word, and the third person, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, always in that order. So it is not a coincidence. It is, it is completely intentional that uh, Daniel is given this promotion of becoming the third ruler in the context in which he is a type of the Holy Spirit of God. And by the way, we have nine different particulars there on the, on the screen in which Daniel's a type of the Holy Spirit in Daniel 5. And nine is the number of fruit bearing. In Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit is, and it lists nine qualities there that constitute the fruit singular of the, of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Nine, the number of fruit bearing. All right, the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father. So again, father in the sense of a progenitor or ancestor, Nebuchadnezzar was Belshazzar's grandfather. Belshazzar, the son of Nabonidus and Nitocris, Nitocris being one of Nebuchadnezzar's two daughters. Then it says, uh, or she says that Nebuchadnezzar had made Daniel master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Well, that goes back to Daniel 2. All right. We mentioned how the events of Daniel 4 go back 33 years earlier. Okay. And the fact that the queen mother here recalls and virtually recites the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar uh, in the first half of Daniel 4 regarding Daniel tells us that uh, this woman had a personal relationship with Nebuchadnezzar. Hence, she's either his daughter or his widow. Okay, um, But now we go back to Daniel 2. She recalls Daniel's promotion to the master of the magicians. And that's in Daniel 2 and verse number 48. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And then the exact title of master of the magicians, you go back to Daniel 4. Verse number nine, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians. 
That was his title, but he, he received it with his promotion back in Daniel 2, verse 48, which took place 67 years earlier than this right here. So again, that really eliminates any possibility of it being anybody else other than Nebuchadnezzar's daughter or his wife. And, and that's part of the reason when, it, when you're talking about a 67-year uh, thing here, that m many people believe that this is actually Nebuchadnezzar's widow um, rather than his daughter. Because if it was Nitocris, she would have to be somewhere in her 80s at this point. Um, and, and that's possible that she was a young girl, um, no more than an adolescent at the time when Daniel came in. I mean, Daniel's still alive at this time, and he's, he's probably, uh, well, he's in his 80s, okay? So, uh, and if he was taken into captivity, as we proposed at the early part of our study of Daniel, when he was about 19 years old, um, then yeah, it's very possible that Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, Nitocris, was, you know, between five and 10 years old when all that happened, or I would say about 10, and she could recall, um, remember her childhood when all this happened and her father uh, talking about it. Verse 12, For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, see, just like we pointed out in our list there of the types of the Holy Spirit, uh, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. She has no doubt. She has no doubt that Daniel can do this. So she is fully aware of the history of the interactions between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. She, she knows what Daniel did in Daniel 2 in telling Nebuchadnezzar the content and the interpretation of his first dream and then interpreting the second dream for him in Daniel 4. She is fully aware of that. Now, What's interesting is that when she says, let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation, there is no indication at this point that Belshazzar remembers Daniel. He doesn't respond and say, oh yeah, I, I, I remember who you're talking about now. I remember Papa talking about him. No. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything along those lines. And that implies at least a couple of things. Number one, that any position that Daniel had in the royal court under Nebuchadnezzar, and he did, he was promoted to being chief of the governors. Okay? So that pretty much means he was like a prime minister. And he's part of the royal court. He was the master of the magicians. So whatever that all entailed... He didn't have it now. He didn't have that rank. He didn't have that position under Belshazzar. In fact, he probably ceased holding any of those positions either with the death of Nebuchadnezzar or even when he was deposed from his kingly throne seven years before his death there in Daniel 4. Okay? The other thing that this implies is that Nebuchadnezzar and his daughter, Nitocris, never told Belshazzar about Daniel. And that, that is amazing to think about. Now, to be fair, um, Belshazzar would have been very young in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? So it's just possible he doesn't remember. Nebuchadnezzar got saved in the last year of his life. Um, but Nitocris knew all of this. And she doesn't say, now, son, I've mentioned this man to you before, but, but your, your pawpaw interacted with a man that was a captive of the Jews named Daniel. And, and I told you about this when you were a boy. You may not remember it, but here's how that went. She doesn't say anything like that. 
It's as if she's recalling all this to him for the first time. That's the implication here. And that's amazing. And the reason why it's amazing, and particularly that Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't mention, we understand that uh, he didn't get saved until the last year of his life. But he still yet experienced, he, he saw miracles. What Daniel did for him in Daniel 2 was a miracle. What he saw in, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace was a miracle. He promoted them as well at the time. Um, and then Daniel 4, regardless. So grandfathers love telling tales about their their upbringing, their childhood, their young adulthood, their past, with their grandchildren. So it's almost unfathomable to think that Nebuchadnezzar never testified to Belshazzar about his interactions with Daniel, but that appears to be the case. The only other, the only other alternative would be that he did mention it, and Belshazzar has just completely forgotten about it. Can't remember it to save his life. Verse number 13, Then was Daniel brought in before the king. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? So they go and they summon Daniel to go in before the king, and Daniel doesn't immediately know why the king has summoned him. But one thing that he was certain of was there's a feast going on. And so he must have just absolutely cringed at the thought of going to this banqueting house. And we shared with you uh, what some historical sources say the size of this banqueting house was. Okay, It was a mile long. To walk in on these nobles all in a drunken stupor and and Daniel thinking the, the Lord himself only knows what all they're involved in, what all's going on at this place, and I've got to go in there. So he, he just must have cringed, cringed at the thought of entering in. Art thou that, Daniel? Again, the tenor of that question indicates that either Belshazzar had never heard of Daniel before this, or if he did remember him, based on his mother's description of him, he didn't say that, and he certainly didn't recognize Daniel. Again, I think the former is the more likely case. He never heard of him until his, his mother brought, it, brought him up here in verses 11 and 12. Um, and of course, the fact that Belshazzar says, Art thou that Daniel? So at the very least, he doesn't even recognize him, tells me there's no way Daniel could still be chief of the governors. Because if he held that title at this point, there's no doubt that he would have had interaction with Belshazzar. And Belshazzar would not only know his name, he'd know his face, right? He'd be interacting with him. So Daniel's no longer involved in politics at this point and hadn't been probably for... Um, well, 33 years or more, okay? So likely a Daniel had vacated the position um, when either Nebuchadnezzar died or when he was deposed from power seven years earlier, okay? Art thou that Daniel which art of the children of the captivity of Judah? So we know historically there were three waves of captives taken into Babylon, 606 B.C., 599 B.C., and 587 B.C. Daniel and his companions were taken in that first captivity in 606 B.C. And we commented on that in chapter 1. So he's uh, children of the captivity of Judah. That first captivity, you can write down Daniel 2, verse 25. Daniel 6, verse 13 as well. Uh, and then you can cross-reference Daniel 1, verses 3 and 4 for the first captivity itself. Whom, my king the, uh, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry. Jewry, not jewelry. Jewry is a word that appears three times in our King James Bible. Three is a, a, a number of generation. 
It also appears in Luke 23, 5 and John 7, 1, and just simply means a, a place or places that are inhabited by Jews. Uh, so it could be another name for Judea, as an example. I have even heard of thee. And what he's referring to is what his mother just said to him just previously. Not that he had heard of him before Nidocris mentioned anything, because he apparently had not. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And just exactly what his mother said, the queen mother there in verse 11. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And that's in verse 8. They couldn't do it. And I have heard of thee, again, going back to what his, his mother testified to him in the court there, verses 11 and 12, I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So the offer extended to the wise men, and they failed because they could not read the writing, much less interpret it. The offer is now extended to Daniel. I'll clothe you in scarlet, I'll put a chain of gold about your neck, all representing a position of nobility and honor and authority. And... It, not just symbolic, but actual power, I'll make you the third ruler in the kingdom, under only Nabonidus and Belshazzar themselves. Uh, so this, this offer is in verse 7, here in verse 16, and again in verse 29. I think we've shared with you previously how a similar thing was done to Joseph in Genesis 41. Uh, there's no mention, of course, of being clothed in scarlet, but there is mention of a gold chain, and Joseph was made second ruler by Pharaoh. Only in the throne was Pharaoh greater than Joseph. In fact, uh, power to rule was pretty much delegated by Pharaoh to Joseph. Thou shalt rule my kingdom. And Joseph pretty much called all the shots, uh, accountable only to Pharaoh. So Joseph, a type of Jesus Christ, amen? Second person of the Godhead. Here in Daniel 5, Daniel, a type of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. Both Daniel and Joseph, by the way, were taken from their homeland to a foreign land. Isn't that interesting? Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven, didn't he? Came down here to be born of a virgin, live a sinless life for 33 and a half years, die on an old rugged cross for your sins and mine, rise again from the dead after three days, he ascended back up into heaven. But he left his homeland to come to this foreign land for you and me. And then 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes down from heaven, right, to this foreign land, this world. And indwells the corporate body, where the individual bodies comprising the, cor and co and comprising the corporate body of the church. And so now the Holy Spirit of God, every time a person receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior... They're baptized with the Holy Spirit. He comes upon us. He comes within us. He fills us. And he never leaves us nor forsakes us. So both left their homeland to come to this foreign land. Very interesting. All right. Um, verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. Let your gifts be to yourself. Uh, that's what pretty much what Abraham said, if you remember, back in Genesis 14, when uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah tried to lavish him with gifts, right, um, for getting the victory in the war there. But Genesis 14 and verse number 22, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldst say I have made Abram rich. 
So yeah, he, he refused to take anything, and Daniel's also refusing to take anything from Belshazzar here. He essentially says, after the offer is extended to him, he's like, keep it. Just keep it. Why? Because he knew. If nothing else, he knew that the offer was completely empty. Babylon's days were numbered. Daniel knew this. He knew it by virtue of a number of ways. Number one, we're going to see when we get to Daniel 9 that Daniel was a student of Bible prophecy. And he was reading the book of Jeremiah. He knew the approximate time frame that Babylon was going to be in power. That, that God would be judging the southern kingdom through captivity in Babylon. He knew this. Okay, Number two. He, 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 the Lord gave him the content and interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's first dream in Daniel 2. And he knew, he knew that Babylon would not be a perpetual kingdom, that it would be succeeded by a second kingdom. He knew that the head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, but that the, the breast and arms of silver represented another kingdom. It wasn't Babylon. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian successor. It was a different kingdom. Thirdly, by this time, he had already had two additional visions. That in Daniel 7 with the four beasts, which basically gives the same prophetic information that, that uh, the Lord gave Daniel in regard to the content and interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, only here, Instead of elements on an image, the Gentile world powers are depicted as four great beasts. But again, it's a reiteration that Babylon, represented by the lion with the eagle's wings, would not last forever. It would be succeeded by another kingdom. And then the prophetic vision that came to Daniel in the third year, uh, let me backtrack, that vision in Daniel 7 occurred in the first year of Belshazzar. In Daniel 8, the vision Daniel has occurs in the third year of Belshazzar, and it's there where he sees a ram and a he-goat, and he comes to understand that they represent the kingdoms of the Medes and the Persians. Okay, The, the, the ram and then the, the he-goat represents the king of Greece. So he knew um, who the first kingdom was, the second kingdom, and the third kingdom. He knew that the succession of Gentile world empires, by the third year of Belshazzar, he knew this, would go Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. He knew this. He knew this. So he knew Babylon's days were numbered. And even though he may not have known that Babylon's time period would be exactly 70 years, he may not have known that yet at this time. He certainly would know it by the time of Daniel 9. He certainly would. Okay, um, but he still knew from studying Jeremiah, from Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, that Babylon was going to be judged. Okay, so he knew their days were numbered. So he, he had been uh, the chief of the governors of Babylon. He'd been there and done it. Okay, um, he'd been out of it now for 33 years. He had no interest in getting involved in it again. That's another reason that he would just say, keep it. I'll interpret it for you, but I, I don't want any of that. Now, I'll stop here and say he's going to get it anyway. And we'll talk about that when we get to the end of chapter 5. He still gets that promotion. He doesn't want it, but he gets it. Okay? All right, verse number 18. And thou, O king, the most high God, gave... Nebuchadnezzar thy father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Indeed. Um, go back to verse 11. The kingdom was given to Nebuchadnezzar thy father. Again, father there uh, representing an ancestor. Okay, As we know, Nebuchadnezzar was Belshazzar's grandfather. But it says that the Lord, the Most High God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, majesty, glory, and honor. We've commented before how the Lord uh, told Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel on a number of occasions 
You didn't get your kingdom because of your power and your might and your wisdom. I gave it to you. The Lord, the Lord is the one who sets up kings and removes kings. You can cross-reference Daniel 2, verse 37 and 38. And Daniel 4, verse 36, where Nebuchadnezzar finally gets it. That it's the Lord who gave him his kingdom. See, the Lord alone rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he wills, right? It's exactly what it says in Daniel 4, verses 17, 25, and 32. And he is the one who removes kings and sets up kings, Daniel 2, 21. All right, we're probably going to have to stop there, and we'll pick up on verse 19 next time. But when we get to verse number 19, what we're going to see here is a description of the type of rule that Nebuchadnezzar had. And it's uh, it can only be termed as an absolute dictatorship. It's certainly not a democracy. All right, but we're going to have to stop there for tonight. Oh. Before we go, I'm sorry, we have the slide up on the screen. I didn't address that, did I? Yeah, so let me go go back and address that so you know what you're looking at there. All right, um, all those verses there that you see, the phrase that's in bold and in red, if thou canst. Yeah, so back in verse 16, verse 16 Belshazzar says to Daniel, If thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation, the phrase, if thou canst, appears five times in the Bible. So in addition to this appearance in Daniel 5.16, there's the other four right there. Job 33.5, If thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me, stand up. And then, of course, you have there in Proverbs 30, verse 4, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended, who hath gathered the wind in his fists, who hath bound the waters in a garment, who hath established all the ends of the earth. What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? And then the final two appearances in Mark 9, verses 22 and 23, where the, the father of the, of the lunatic's son says, And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters and to, to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So five appearances of the expression, If thou canst. That's what that is right there. Okay, now we can wrap it up. Uh, I suppose that most, if not every one of you who's watching us, listening to us here tonight, uh, has already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if that's the case, amen. Praise the Lord. But just in case anybody listening to us has never done that, uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that right now because there's nothing more important than that. Uh, we mentioned when we talked about our Judgment Island ministry that the purpose is to demonstrate, to portray the imminency of death. None of us is promised Tomorrow, none of us is promised the rest of the day or our next breath. Death truly is imminent. In addition, the rapture of the church is also an imminent event. And if you die or are left behind at the rapture of the church, if either death or the rapture takes place before you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're going to spend eternity in hell. And I don't think you want to do that. I don't think you want to do that. No reasonably minded person would ever want to spend eternity in hell. Well, the Bible truth is that if we don't trust Jesus as our Savior, that's where we're all headed. Without Jesus Christ, without faith in him, anybody and everybody is going to hell. Okay? The bad news is, is that we're all guilty sinners and we're under the penalty of eternal death. So let me share scripture with you on that before we get to the good news. Romans 3 and verse 23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, 23, the first part of the verse says, the wages of sin is death. So simply put, we're all sinners. And in order to get to heaven, we've got to have the glory of God. But once we've sinned, that's it. Because we, we can't erase our sins. We can't 
get rid of what we've already said, thought, or done. We, we can't get rid of it. And regardless of what religious leaders have told you, there's nothing that you can do, nothing I can do to get rid of that sin in and of ourselves. We Baptism doesn't do it. Joining the church and doing the best you can, doing a series of rites, rituals, and sacraments, or whatever you want to call them, it doesn't take away any of our sins. And because we've sinned against God, there's a penalty. There's a sentence involved. The judge has decreed that the sentence, the penalty for our sin is death. It's both physical death and spiritual death. Separation from God in a place called hell. Revelation 21.8 says that the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's because... Even though, even though many sins are committed by the body, not all of them are, but every sin, including those done with the body, originate right here in your heart, in my heart. They're spiritual. They're always spiritual. So that's the bad news. And the reason why we give you the bad news is because you've got to realize you're a lost sinner in need of a Savior before you can be saved, right? Otherwise, if you don't see a need to, to be saved, and I'll just say this, there's a very famous, celebrated politician um, running for president right now whose policies you and I as born-again believers, for the most part, wholeheartedly embrace. But that dear person, at, at least at the time of this lesson, does not believe they're a person who needs forgiveness. You can't be that type of person, okay? In order to be saved, you've got to recognize you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And the Bible very clearly states that about all of us. So now, here's the good news. You don't have to go to hell. But there is something that you're going to need to do. And that is... You need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior by faith. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. He paid that awful price. He paid the penalty for your sins and mine. He rose again the third day, and so the gift of eternal life is offered as a free gift to any and all who will receive it. But you must receive it by putting your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior. That's the only way you get it. Okay? Here's the scripture to support that. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The last part of Romans 6, 23 says, The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, it's through him. Christ's death and resurrection makes salvation possible for every single person on this planet. But the only way anybody does get saved is by coming to Jesus and receiving them as their Savior. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou, the individual, you, me, will be saved. I did that on September 29, 1986. Are you willing to do that right here tonight on October 15th, 2024? If so, then pray with me. I'm going to say a prayer right now. The, repeat after me. The words themselves are not what saves you, but pay attention to the words. And if you agree with them, if that's you, that you repeat them in your heart, audibly if you need to. But it's the faith, the belief in what you're saying that is what's going to save you. Okay? Dear God in heaven, I confess that I am a lost sinner, and I do deserve to go to hell for my sins, according to your word. I thank you that you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus to pay for my sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me so much to pay that awful price, to take that hell for me to die in my place. 
I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins and rose again the third day. I believe that your death paid for all of my sins in full and that you can and will save me if I ask you to. And so the best way I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me of all of my sins and come into my heart, save my soul, and give me a home in heaven. I'm putting my trust in you and only you to get me to heaven, not anything I've done or anything I'll ever do. Transform me from the inside and out and help me to live for you. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're saved because God said so. All right, our time has come and gone. So until next time, folks, study to show yourselves approved unto God. Put on the whole armor of God and be steadfast, unmovable, and always abound in the work of the Lord. Till next time, we love you and we're praying for you. We ask that you do the same for us. We're going to leave you with a little bit more of Magnify. This is our choir from 2023 Revival. So until next time, folks, bye.